Father, we come to you this, this morning and just praise you and thank thee that we can come together, uh, whether here in person or listening uh, by live stream or cable TV. Lord, we just thank thee that we can come together and glorify your name. And, O oh Lord, it is our desire this morning as we come together that we know your presence. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And, O oh Lord, we, we just praise thee uh, for the hope that we have that even this little meeting like this uh, will someday pass away and we'll, we'll be with the Lord and see him face to face. So, Lord, we just thank you for the promise of your coming and just pray that you would be with us here as we gather together. Lord, that your presence would be known amongst us. You'd be with our speaker, Mike, Mark, and just uh, be with him, be with each one as we sit under the sound of your word, Lord, that it might be seed sowed upon good ground and may bring forth uh, plentiful. So we just praise thee and thank thee for this time together. Be with those that are unable to be with us, Lord. Just to encourage and bless them where they are as we thank you in his name. Amen. Our next hymn, 59, and our red book, I will sing the mighty power of God. making out well, the first part's easy because many of us have learned it a long time ago so the first part of the verse is easy but the second part let's say it together for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing it is the gift of God not a result of works so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I wonder if I took that down, how many would be able to do that really good? I'm sure, I'm sure. A few announcements uh, before we sing our last hymn, before our speaker comes. Uh, the Chapel Airs, uh, most know who the Chapel Airs are. They're singing at the rec center here in Exeter at two o'clock. Uh, so if anybody is interested in going to that at two o'clock, it sounds like a good time. Uh, you can just go down in the park in the rain and have a pizza or something and then go to the chapel airs after. Uh, so remember that. Uh, the VBS meeting, uh, we're not very organized. Our VBS leaders are here today and we're having a meeting next week. How's that work? Well, uh, there's so many away today for different reasons, so we didn't think it was going to work out today. So we're going to have a VBS meeting right after this service next Sunday uh, just, uh, just to be able to get uh, coordinated as far as the games and stuff are concerned. April's pretty well got a pretty good outline for us, but uh, uh, just to make sure that we get people to sign. So the VBS meeting after this service next week should only be 15 or 20 minutes, just enough to, to get some people designated. Um, I mentioned in the earlier meeting, I remember our sister Star Bockert, Star and Dale. Uh, Star's uh, had quite a setback the last couple of days and 
the prognosis is not real good. So remember Star and, and Dale in our prayers uh, and the family at this time. Uh, also, Jean Flynn, seemed good to see her. She's coming along. Or Laverne got new wheels this week, so I see he had to get Jean new wheels too. So he's got a walker she's working around with. Uh, also, the Doug Finkbinder family, remember them too, for those that know. Uh, Doug Finkbinder family, remember them in Doug's passing. Karen is doing real well. We're around to see Karen this week. She's doing real well. Rob, need, Rob needs our prayers. He's... Uh, He's, he's really struggling with the, he, I think he, the way he said it is, a week seems like a month. Yeah, I think is what he, oh, don't, don't say that, okay. Remember Rob and our prayers, yeah. And also Will Beckett too. Will was quite distort, distraught this morning about the fact that we put his 60th birthday in the bulletin. So remember Will as well. So keep all these things in mind uh, for prayer. We're gonna sing one more hymn and then uh, good to have Mark Hard work with us from uh, Faith Mission. Uh, just moved, I shouldn't say just moved, you've been in Clinton now for a little while now, so getting settled there, I'm sure. But I was talking to April and they got pretty busy next couple months with uh, camps and, and VBSs and stuff, so uh, remember them as well. Uh, last hymn then, uh, it's We Will Glorify. I think we know this one. some joke about the power going out, but we're praying that the power of the Lord falls. Lord, um, thanks again uh, for the invitation and allowing us to be here. And even as Jim was saying, we certainly do appreciate your prayers. Uh, summer, it, it, I don't think it's any busier than the, the rest of the year. It's just more condensed and, and it's just different. Um, we actually have six of the next, well, actually seven of the next eight weeks where we're going to be doing either camp at the Faith Mission Center or uh, Vacation Bible School, either here or elsewhere. And so we certainly do covet your prayers for, uh, for health, for strength, uh, just that the, the gospel would go out and that uh, the kids that are going to be impacted with that message uh, would find saving faith in Christ. Um, certainly, uh, we recognize that John Bennett was here just a few weeks ago, so we have tons of uh, partners in prayer at, at the back on the back table, so feel free to take one. Uh, it's our quarterly prayer update, just a, a little bit of information about what's going on in the work of the Faith Mission in Canada, uh, across Canada, from Quebec to BC, and um, again, all of the various summer ministries that are taking place uh, there. Um, and so, again, thank you so much. Um, before we turn to our, our passage this morning, we're going to be in, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13 this morning, but I'd like to read for you Romans chapter 10. Um, so go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 10, and we'll pick up in verse 9. Um, just as, as we read this, we recognize that the Apostle Paul really, really sets the stage for, for what we are going to see, and certainly some of the things that uh, get wrestled with in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 13, but... Uh, well, you'll see when we get there. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me, but of Israel. He says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. The word of the Lord. Go ahead and and flip back to, to Matthew chapter 13 and we'll ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. God, we thank you for the truth of the hymn that we just sang, that that we serve the King of kings and Lord of lords, and, and we want to see honor and glory to your name. May the name of Jesus be lifted high. We recognize that we do not gather together this morning to, to hear wise or persuasive words or human wisdom, but God, we long to see your Spirit's power, and we long to hear your voice. We ask, God, that you would, by your word and by your spirit, speak your truth into our hearts and into our lives, that you would mold us and shape us from the inside out into the image and likeness of your son, Jesus. Uh, We thank you that it is his power and it is his name that changes hearts and lives for eternity. It is faith in him alone and his finished work on the cross. And it's in his beautiful name we pray. Amen. Obviously, before we we get too far into Matthew chapter 13, you'll understand why we needed to start with Romans 10, Uh, because it highlights uh, a lot of what's going on in this section of Matthew's gospel, and honestly, what is is still going on in the world, if you have eyes to see. And maybe it's going on in your heart this morning as well. Salvation is through the finished work of Christ on the cross alone, and that is simple, praise the Lord. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It is not rocket science. Um, But in spite of how simple it is, people still miss it. In fact, we read, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he's heard from us? So faith comes from hearing And hearing through the word of Christ, but I ask, have they not heard? And Paul says, actually, they have. They have heard. And so the question then becomes, have they not understood? Israel thought that they had it all figured out. That they they knew who the Messiah was supposed to be, how the Messiah was supposed to live and act, and, and they had a nice little box that they had him fit into. But Matthew 13 starts what's known as the parable discourse, because along comes Jesus, and he starts teaching in parables a visual picture, a story used to illustrate this this moral or spiritual lesson, which seems to make it harder for people to believe. Look at Matthew 13, verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and a great crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables. In fact, there are eight 
parables in this section of Matthew's gospel alone. Verse 34, we read that all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And what Jesus chooses to focus on in this passage in Matthew 13 is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Eight parables that he uses are like, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and and sowed in his field. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven hidden in three measures of flour. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and and gathered fish of every kind. And every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And of course, the very first parable that Jesus uses in Matthew 13, and the parable that we will focus on this morning, is the poorly named but very familiar parable of the sower. Verse 3. And Jesus told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then Jesus says, he who has ears... Let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Jesus, we we got a question for you about your teaching methods. They said, why, why do you speak to them in parables? Why not just come out and just say the truth plainly? And Jesus' answer is striking. He answered them saying, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. And their eyes, they have closed. Notice that that is a conscious decision to close their eyes. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn. And if they did those things, Jesus says, I would heal them. But, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, and didn't see it. And to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. The sower, the seed, and the soil. Point number one this morning as we look at Jesus' parable here is the sower. This first parable always is referred to as the parable of the sower, but in all honesty, it's not a great title or or really even an accurate one. Um, Of the three things that Jesus specifically mentions in this parable, the sower gets arguably the least amount of attention Certainly the least detail, and rightly so. The sower is anonymous and could and should be anyone. 
They're simply the one carrying the bag of seed and sowing it. All we know about the sower in this parable is that he's doing his job. And he gets no special credit, no recognition for doing it, because that's not the point of the parable. Back at the end of the 19th century, there were two famous preachers in London, England. C.H. Spurgeon, which you've probably heard of, uh, was one of them. And for decades, Spurgeon packed the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. They would regularly get 5,000 people every Sunday morning. And he would preach with no microphones and just his booming voice. And he did that for about 50 to 60 years. That's incredible. My voice hurts just thinking about it. The other preacher was not far from the Metropolitan Tabernacle, was a man called Joseph Parker, who preached at the city temple, which was arguably another large church. It's a big church in London, and both men used to draw enormous crowds. And from an earthly outward perspective, both men were incredibly successful. But there was a difference. They used to say that if you mingled out with the crowd outside the city temple, on a Sunday morning as people were leaving from the church service, you, you could overhear people saying things like, what a great preacher. What, what a great orator, because Parker was just famous for his preaching. But they said if you mingled with the crowds outside the Metropolitan Tabernacle on a Sunday morning, you would hear people saying things like, what a great God we have. What a great Savior we have Because the focus needs to be all on the Lord, all on Jesus. May our lives, in spite of their weaknesses and failings, even in anonymity, point not to ourselves, but to Jesus to magnify his name. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus says, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not, rather, say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy or unprofitable servants. We have only done what was our duty. R.C. Sproul asked the question, what deed could I possibly do that was not something that God required of me in the first place? Remember, he commands us to be perfect, and we can't improve on perfection. In fact, we can't even hope to reach that goal. He says, I have no profit of my own because I earn nothing by doing what I'm required to do. That's why our redemption is by grace and grace alone. There is one thing, he says, that I can place before God that is, properly speaking, my own, my sin. That's the one thing that we can claim, that that is truly ours. We give it to the Lord. Yeah, God, you need to take that from us. He said, the only thing that can redeem me is not my work, but the work that Christ has performed on my behalf. He freely came to do the Father's will and to submit himself to the law for our sake. He and he alone is a profitable servant. If we serve out of an effort to earn our way into the kingdom of God, we are deceiving ourselves. The motivation for Christian service is love for God. We serve not to earn salvation, but because Christ already has purchased salvation for us. It's the truth of that hymn that we sing, Rock of Ages that says, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. No matter how exemplary our service, we gain nothing by it that we can offer to God to procure his favor. And so no, the parable of the sower in Matthew 13 is not about the sower. Well then we ask, what about point number two, the seed? What what, what about that? And we certainly can never underestimate the immense power in the seed. Because as Jesus is about to explain to the disciples, 
he's not really talking about gardening. He's not talking about farming. He's not talking about agriculture or botany. No, no, the seed is something way cooler and even more powerful. Look at verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone, and notice the repeated phrase, hears the word. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, verse 23, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word. And not just hears the word, but who hears the word and understands it. Indeed, he bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and another thirty. And just like an earthly sower or gardener or farmer has no power to make a plant grow. Wouldn't that be incredible, right? We could just tell our crops, grow, and they would listen. That would be amazing. Because life is in the seed. We don't have the power, but the life is already in the seed, and for it to sprout, it has to go into the ground and die. We can't make, spiritually speaking, a person believe, as much as we would like to. We can't save anyone. It's the word of God that has all the power. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But Jesus didn't preach or teach in a way that would foster easy believism. And just like, oh, that's so easy to follow Jesus. He didn't preach and teach in a way where people wouldn't stop and consider the cost It's why he spoke in parables. It's why he said things like, you're just following me, not for me, but because you want to see a miracle. And the crowds would be like, yeah, I think that's why we're following him. We totally want to see the miracle. And in that passage, they were talking about the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 because they really wanted Jesus to just keep doing that one over and over again. Forget pizza in the park. Jesus is multiplying fish and loaves, guys. This is going to be amazing. We don't even have to buy the fish and loaves. Jesus is giving it to you for free. And so Jesus would say, so to truly follow me, you need to to up the game. You need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And people were like, wait, what did he just say? That didn't sound right to our ears. That... That sounds too hard. And we read that after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And so Jesus turns to the disciples and he says, well, what about you guys? Do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter, who said a lot of things quickly and often badly, gets this one right. He says, Lord, to whom... Shall we go? Where else can we go, Lord? Where else can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus is it. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one's getting to God except through him. He is the Word who was with God and is God and became flesh. Isaiah 55, 3 says, Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, hear that your soul may live. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon Isaiah 55, 10, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The sower may be anonymous, but the seed, the word, has all the power. Never underestimate the saving power of the word of God. It's why above all else, above every instruction, every piece of advice that the Apostle Paul would give to Timothy later on in this gospel, 
He says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, what does he tell them? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming, and we would argue maybe the time's already here, when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And your ministry is to preach the word. Sower, sow the seed. But here's the thing. The parable of the sower isn't about the sower. It's not even about the seed. No, the parable of the sower is about the soil. Point number three this morning. In Matthew 13, verses 18 to 23, Jesus explains the meaning of the parable. He says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone, and notice how many times he repeats this phrase, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Notice that there are four types of soil, and notice that each and every one of them clearly hears the word, but it's the condition of their heart that determines whether it takes root or not. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, but I ask, have they not heard? Indeed, they have. The problem isn't hearing. For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? And that's where the parable of the sower hits home. It's understanding. Rico Tyson, in his video series Christianity Explored, puts it like this. Just as seeds will only grow if you plant them properly... So the good news about Jesus will only change your life if you hear it properly. We need to ask the question this morning of ourselves, how am I responding to the gospel? What kind of soil am I? Have the cares of this world choked out my love for the Savior? Have I become distracted by the things around me? Or am I truly running after the things of the Lord? The question becomes not just have I heard it, because lots of people have heard, but have I heard and have you understood all these things? The psalmist in Psalm 95 verse 6 says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. 
But then he concludes with this warning in verse 8. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Your eternal destination depends on it. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word and your gracious Holy Spirit that opens our eyes to see and opens our ears to hear and opens our hearts and our minds to understand and receive the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we can be set free. That we are sinners separated and fallen short of the glory of God and in desperate need of a savior that we cannot save ourselves but one's already been provided for us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we pray for the proclamation of the gospel that the the sower would continue to sow the seed. And as we come into the summer season, we think of all of the the various ministries that, that take place through camps and through vacation Bible schools and all of those opportunities that those kids are going to have to hear the word, to, to, to come face to face, and for many cases, for the first time, with the truth of the gospel. God, would you already be preparing their hearts? God, would you be preparing good soil to receive that seed? God, we pray for each one of us here this morning, or whether they're listening online. God, we pray that you would give us hearts that are ready and willing to receive the free gift of salvation that's being offered to us. We pray for our communities, we pray for our neighbors and our friends that we know are going into a crisis eternity unless, God, you grab a hold of their hearts. Lord, open their eyes to their condition of being lost. And Lord, open their eyes to the gift of the Savior. We pray that that message would go out in power, even as the promise of Isaiah 55 says, it will never return to you empty or void, but it's going to accomplish everything you set it out to do. God, have your way in us. Have your way in our towns, in our province, in our country, and in our world. Lord, as we pray for the advancement of the kingdom of God and the proclamation of the gospel, and it's in Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. And amen.